Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Theatre Art Life discussion with the wonderful Bonnie Comley. And we almost forgot to go live because we were so busy chatting before this session opened. So <laughs> excuse us for being a minute late because we were, we were talking uh, uh, each other's heads off. So thank you for joining us today. Before we get started and I, before I introduce Bonnie to you all, I want to get started with a little bit of our housekeeping as we usually do for those who have not joined us before. Um, in the right, you've got a chat box, so please feel free to ask questions, say hi, tell us where you're from, um, and, uh, you know, engage with us throughout this discussion. We really want to hear from you. If for any reason you drop out, you can log back any, in any time via the email link that was sent to you. If you can't hear us for any reason, please try logging out and logging back in. And if you have sketchy internet, a replay is available and will be sent to you personally 24 hours after this session. Generally, we get it even earlier than that. Um, so we'll always send the replay to you if you have um, uh, sketchy internet. So uh, that's just how we're going to get started on that. So this is Bonnie Comley. Bonnie Comley is a producer and the CEO and founder of Broadway HD. So welcome to Theatre Art Life, Bonnie. Thank you. I'm sorry for being a bad influence at the beginning here, but you're a <laughs> <laughs> No, it's fantastic. Now we've got nothing left to say. Exactly, exactly. So um, I want to get started with, before we get into Broadway HD, um, you, you've been a producer for how many years now? Uh, well, for theatre, probably 25, but for film, I go way back longer than that. <laughs> right. Way back. Well, so right. there's producing in different uh, different mediums. Yeah. Well, how did, so how did you start in, in, in the industry then? Tell, tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm 61 years old, so I have a long history of being in, uh, in show business. I, uh, my undergraduate degree is in business. My graduate degree is in uh, TV production. I, w I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, then moved to New York in graduate school to uh, get an internship, and I ended up getting a job here in New York City, so I stayed. Um, the job that I got was uh, TV and uh, being a reporter and host on a couple of different shows that covered entertainment. So and specifically entertainment in New York, which is theater. So I was, uh, I'd never actually gone to Broadway, never seen Broadway until I came to New York and then I was being paid to go to the theater. So it was actually a dream job. And I did that for a number of years and being on camera, on TV, gave me access to agents, to other opportunities that I didn't, really qualify for. Um, but because TV is a medium that uh, makes you well known, I was able to get commercials, I was able to get other TV shows, I was able to get theater, even though I had no training in it. So, um, so I got really, uh, you know, was in the right place at the right time. Um, and uh, so for years, I was trying to make sense of the theater industry because I loved it. But a lot of times uh, when I was covering it for TV, people would say, why is there not more theater on TV? And I'd say, well, there's a thousand different reasons. Why. <laughs> um, a lot of it is uh, because it just doesn't look good a lot of times unless it's done really well. Um, so over the years I did, you know, I probably produced uh, over 40 different films. I worked on TV series where I was writing, segment producing. I was able to do sort of everything uh, on a team, uh, what we called EMG teams at that time, which was electronic news gathering wow. <laughs> back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and it was like big cameras. So in addition to like knowing how to use all the equipment, uh, I was able, you know, so I was able to do sets and lighting and you know set up set up the light set up the cameras help with the dragging these huge decks that went along with these great big cameras you know those sorts of things really understanding the vocabulary of everybody that works in the job and everybody that works in that um, medium with you so whether it was tv or then going into um you know, film and theater, understanding what everybody else's job is and the vocabulary that helps you talk to them is shorthand that helps get the job done faster because all of these mediums are very collaborative. And the more, uh, the, the better teammate you are, the better, uh, the, the more likely you are to continue with that job and to get the next one because so much of show business is about, you know, this is the job I have today, 
but I'm always looking forward for like, what is the next job? Sure. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a great, uh, you know, great experience for me to be able to have all this, um, you know, different mediums that I work in and Broadway HD was the, was the, you know, culmination of bringing them all together. So, um, that's kind of 40 years and in a short in a short summary no <laughs> and I, I guess that's really quite interesting that you say because you started with tv so then it is quite a natural um evolution for, for you to start something like broadway hd because you know you've got that experience and background in television and you're bringing it to capturing the live live uh entertainment industry in broadway and you do more than just broadway shows though right in terms of what's on broadway hd Yes, well, Broadway HD, we cover, uh, well, you know, our, our core content, the ideal content was always that it was a Broadway show and that it was always alive in front of an audience show and that it was always in HD technology, high definition technology or higher. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as we tried to put the platform together, we found that, oh, you know what, there was some other shows that were done before HD that if somebody was interested in HD, maybe we just put a disclaimer on it and that would work too. So we, you know, with Broadway HD, that's really, I think that's the legacy that Broadway HD leaves behind is that we are the first to the marketplace with a, you know, catalog of stage to screen full length captures. Mm. And uh, and the, the, the digital capture, the, the definition that we use is really exactly what I said. It's, you know, in front of an audience while, while the audience is there, it's a paid audience. This, the stage production is going on in real time and it's being captured in real, you know, in, in real time. Mm. Um, and that is, you know, different than a movie when you take that same script or, and or songs, if it's a musical and then, bring it to Hollywood and you make a movie out of it. So the capture is, it's almost like a documentary in the, in the sense that, or a sporting event that you're capturing as it's live. We might do an ideally, we do more than one production. We shoot more than one and then we edit them together so that we get the, what's the perfect, you know, piece of video content to, uh, to be immortalized, to live on. Mm. Um, and that's a, that's a skill of bringing a whole different, you know, whole TV crew in to where a theater crew, a theater team has, you know, envisioned something for the stage. So it's really collaborative. It's really invasive. It's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's really worth it. It's really worth it. Yeah. So when you first started it, before you launched Broadway HD, did you decide to capture a certain amount? Because obviously you would have had to have a certain uh, library of shows before you launched the, the platform, right? Well, what happened is um, my husband is also a theater producer. And so he uh, had been involved in digital capture even before me. And so this idea of you're working on a show and you're able to go into the theater and shoot it and preserve it. Um, and so what has happened in the, you know, the first one that he was involved with was uh, the Will Rogers Follies back in like 1992 at the Palace Theater. Um, and there's a couple of things. Uh, there's a lot of things at play about why I, and why I get asked, why aren't there more digital captures? Why isn't every Broadway show captured like this? Um, and there are a lot of reasons. And the biggest one is really the fear of the cannibalization of the tickets to the live show. So mm. what that means is no one, no one objects to having this great digital capture done of their show. What they're objecting to is I'm, you know, trying to sell tickets to a live theatrical stage show. And at the same time, it's in a digital form someplace and usually for much less money. So mm. the fear is like, oh my God, that's going to damage my ticket, my box office. So I don't want that. And there really hasn't been anybody that was, because they're so expensive, that built into the capitalization of the show, which is what I've been advocating for for a long time. Like, you know, put that money in, put that money into the budget to, you know, to, to capture it. And mm. then because I do believe that there is a real value to the original cast. So capture that original cast and then you have it. So mm. it's a marketing tool for you going forward. And I really believe that it is additive and it's marketing, you know, material that you have for this show. Um, I have only, you know, anecdotal evidence to that. There's no definitive 
proof that, oh, yes, indeed, if you do a capture and you've got it streaming 24-7, that people can afford it, that that's going to increase ticket sales. Um, and there probably never will be because it's like there's no two shows that are the same. So everything mm. is, you know, it's not a one size fits all. Um, and so over the years, what we've been able to do is when there was a show that we were working on, if we were able to capture it, we would go in and we were like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Let's do this. Mm. Capture it, you know, multi-camera, high definition, beautiful capture. And then it's about where is your distribution? So just like a movie, where do you go first? Do you go to the movie theater? Do you go to, you know, TV? What What are the who's looking for it? Who's going to give you money for that? And when um, when we started and when a lot of this started, there really wasn't a place on TV for it, except for PBS or the BBC. It was kind of mm. a lot of the, you know, people think of Broadway or West End shows as being a little too arty for everybody else. It was this sort of, and still has that, um, I don't want to say stigma, but that uh, sort of reputation around it, that it's, you know, high art and culture if it's on Broadway, and therefore it's not for the masses. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, and, and so it made it, you know, it's double-edged. So you make something that's so fabulous and exclusive and, you know, it's a special event and that's great. So you can charge high ticket prices. So when it's your anniversary or it's grandma's birthday or, you know, somebody's, you know, somebody else's special occasion, then, okay, let's go to the theater because that's a special event. Yeah. But at least here, you know, I'm in New York. I've been living in New York. I grew up in, you know, the United States. So I speak more from my experience of living in New York, working in New York City, doing some tours out there in the U.S., doing a little bit of shows in the West End. Um, but is that my cat that's I think speaking it is. already? I'm so sorry. It's all good. He Maybe he wants to get out. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does. Um, but anyway, but, but that idea of capturing something and then where, what are the distribution platforms that you have? So 25 years ago, it was really just the uh, BBC or PBS here in the States and then DVD. Yeah. So, you know, the DVD market um, there and there she is. Isn't she cute? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, oh, good. So over over the years, what has changed is the outlets for distribution. Um, and I think that over the years, what has also changed is the content or the types of shows that are on Broadway has broadened. So when Disney came to uh, Broadway 25 years ago uh, with Beauty and the Beast and started looking at more family entertainment and family audiences and broadening that, you know, what are the, what are the, what can we see on stage? And then what are the captures um, that sort of broadened when you go in and try and capture something that you have a broader appeal show mm. um, to, to market. Um, and then the technology changed. So about uh, six years ago, so my husband and I had done several of these captures and over the years, we probably were involved in about 10 of them. And the different distribution outlets that we had were um, PBS, BBC, DVD, and then um, this other uh, space called uh, Alternative Content or event cinema, which is the, um, oh dear Lord, my little cat's trying to get out now, <laughs> scratching against the door, mm -hmm. um, is trying to, you know, let, oh, I, <laughs> just let him out. It's all right. You can let him I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Kitty. <laughs> I know, kitty. I know. Go, go, go. Go, kitty. I'm so sorry. I hope you like vamped and did a song while I was gone. No, I was maybe I'll run the video we have, Ooh. but it's fine. <laughs> oh my God, that was awful. But anyways, but the where you could actually, you know, show the this type of content. Um, and over the years, we did stuff with MTV. We did, you know, this event cinema came into play, which uh, the Metropolitan Opera and the National Theater still does almost exclusively. They were doing in cinema events that were a limited run. And so you know, a couple of years ago, probably like six or seven years ago now, you know, my husband and I had done about 10 of these digital captures and said, you know, every time people were, they loved it. It was 
you know, like, this is amazing. Why don't you do this all the time? But it was, as I said, it's just invasive, expensive. You know, it, so many times I was just barely getting my money back if I got my money back for these things. Mm. Um, and we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, where is the business in this? And it kind of looked like everybody was going to streaming. So we had only about 10 shows at that time that we had done ourselves. So it was, let's look to other people because we didn't invent this art form of like bringing a camera into the theater. Mm. Um, the BBC and PBS were doing it long before us. Lincoln Center was doing it with PBS long before us. So what we did was we started pulling all that content into one destination. And that, as I said, is really going to be the legacy of Broadway HD is being the aggregator for all of this stage to screen content mm. and being the you know, niche or niche, however you want to pronounce it, for this type of content. So in the same way that, you know, MTV or Cartoon Network, or if you're a horror fan, you like Shudder, or you're an anime fan, you go to Crunchyroll, Broadway HD is the destination for the stage to screen content. Um, and people will, uh, you know, sort of argue or debate, uh, you know, why don't you have everything? And again, as I said, it's that that fear of the cannibalization and because a lot of times people are think they're going to get the movie deal and yeah. for some reason the movie deal well the movie deal is definitely more money because it's going to be a hollywood movie not a digital capture um and i have always argued that i think there's a place for both i think a digital capture of looking at a stage production that's digitize and put on screen is very different than what Hollywood does with a movie. Um, sure. And you can yeah. see that all over the place. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, uh, people that like digital captures like Hollywood musicals as well. You know, so there's a lot of crossover there, um, but it's not the same thing. And I think that one of the things that's coming out of the pandemic is the vision that or the realization that these types of mediums can live side by side and mm. they're different touch points for the same brand you know so disney has an animated lion king and they could do you know they have a stage show that's been tremendously successful they could do a digital capture and then they could do a live action you know so you can have that same amazing story with those same songs that we all know and have them across the board in different in different ways and that has been done with several different things it's been done with you know remakes of movies it's been done mm. with you know remakes of uh you know or revivals of broadway shows um so, so you know, you whenever there's the opportunity we go and run for it and try and get it yeah. So do you think that Sorry. that that's all right? Do you think that perception then has changed because of the pandemic that perhaps that this is a, a, a you know, a multi pronged approach from a producer's perspective, I guess, rather. I mean, there's the public's perception and then there's the producer's perception. So maybe they're going to think coming out of this that both streams are worthwhile, given the fact that people may not travel to see shows anymore, you know, and what what's the benefit maybe for them? monetarily i mean do they get any do they get revenue for it like how do they get, earn revenue from that capture um it depends uh there's you know in the same way that there's a you know hundreds of different ways to put together an indie movie there's hundreds of different ways to put together a digital capture um and again one of the things that i want to make clear about the broadway hd captures is that they're all authorized you know multi-camera uh captures that uh you know are not a, a, you know, a, a, an assembly of bootlegs or illegal uploads that you see now on the internet. So I think that, you know, where do the producers make money is, it's a lot of the brand development. So I think that now they're seeing, oh, there's different distribution outlets that I can go to um, with the internet, what we can do at Broadway HD and what we have done is we geo block. So like your audience is international, they're not gonna see I can block some of the content because the the IP, the you know the uh, rights holders to the scripts don't want it seen in certain markets. So right. I can geo block. So that's geo blocking. So if you have a tour that's going out, I can geo block around it. So you do your Broadway production. I can do it internationally, and then 
geo-block it there, or you're doing the Broadway production, I, I can geo-block it in the tri-state area and be streaming the rest of the U.S. and Canada um, or the rest of the world. So I think that they see that. I think that there's also the, the I think we can put to bed the argument that if you see the digital capture or if you watch a lot of the digital digitized stage to screen that it's going to kill your appetite to go see a live stage production. Mm. I think that we've all learned ex exactly the opposite, which is what I have been saying for years is this watching a digital production increases people's desire to buy a ticket to the live stage show and go see it. Even if it's the same thing they just watched. So mm. they'll watch Phantom of the Opera on Broadway HD, and then they'll buy a ticket to Phantom of the Opera on Broadway because the risk has been eliminated. They know they saw the show. They know they like it. They know they love that music. So the li that, that, that's eliminated the risk. It's a, it's you know, a validation. Like it. It's a, basically a validation of their desire to spend the money. Because Absolutely. They've seen it on the so and can, I think nothing nothing's more prevalent than, say, the, the Hamilton, you know, I haven't seen it live. And I was quite ambivalent before, but now that I've seen it on Disney Plus, then I'm like, yeah, I, I would definitely want to see that show in real life, right? So and, I will wait for that go. moment <laughs> when we can travel and we can Until do that. So we can get back and see it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, because it's, it's, it's the, you know, I've been faced with that all along is that, you know, when I say, I did, oh, I just did this great digital capture of, you know, she loves me. Well, it's not as good as going to the theater, you know, it's like, you know, did, I don't think anyone said that. <laughs> so yeah. If I took you out for a great French meal at a lovely French restaurant, at the end of it, you wouldn't look at me and say, well, this isn't, you know, a replacement for taking me to Paris. <laughs> like, yeah. No, no one said it was. And I think that those types of arguments are going to be put to the side, um, especially, especially as we see that. Uh, regional theaters around the U.S. are now selling their subscriptions that include the option of a digital capture. So they're right. selling um, their, you know, their their sixth show or eighth show, whatever they're going to be able to do in 2021, 2022 uh, season. And they're selling, you know, here's the cost for the subscription. If we don't have the live version, if we can't gather, you'll get access to the digital um, mm. or you'll have access to watch this you know at another time so there's the live or a digital capture that you get to watch it later um, so they're giving the option interesting, or interesting. if or if you know the theater is still open and you're just not comfortable you haven't gotten your vaccine or you're just not comfortable going to to the theater that you have the option of staying home and watching yeah. it online so that's out there and you know so for all of the people that said it's not the same thing they're selling tickets to sell that's not the same thing and realizing yeah. that this is additive to what they're doing this whole idea yeah. of this you know the digital engagement the brand awareness uh, whether it's for their particular theater or to back to your point about what does it get for the producer of the original, you know, of the show, it's brand awareness. If people mm. are already, you know, what are, what are we looking for all the time as commercial producers or even as nonprofit theaters? We're looking for people to be talking about your show because even with the digital part of theater, the digitized version, nothing sells like word of mouth. So word of mouth for, sure. for theater has always been the strongest. So you want people talking about your show and then you want to fill those seats. And so what's the best way to do that is if somebody's already seen the show. If somebody's already seen that show and said, oh, you've got to see this. This was amazing. Oh, I watched, you know, fill, drop in whatever show. And, and now I can't wait to see it. Is it is it coming near me? Is it live? And then what we can, you know, it, it, it gets people aware of that particular show. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 just enhancing that brand in a way that they could never do before. Um, yeah. And that's huge. That's huge. So there's a different kind of a valuation on that than there is of, oh, I sold six tickets at $100 a piece. Um, you know, ask any 
marketing person, you know, like what's the cost of, you know, digital engagement and all, you know, and it's like, there's a thousand different answers. There. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, hard to quantify. Brian has a good question. Uh, and it's something that I, I think is a great um, thing that I'd want to ask too. Is there a compromise or adjustment needed for the original lighting design when you're doing a digital capture or are you capturing it as it is and as it's lit? Um, you know, how does the lighting and the film people uh, work that out? What our ideal is for Broadway HD and Broadway HD, our originally our content, as I said, was we were going out, we were producing the stage show or part of the stage show with partners. We were doing the digital capture and we were finding distribution and we were marketing. Now we've put this platform in place that is global, that has, you know, has subscribers in, you know, a hundred and I don't know what we're up to like 132 different countries as of like this morning, um, you know, with millions of people coming at this internationally, you know, all the time. So, you know, we're now in a position that we can license content from somebody else. We don't have the burden of financing the, you know, the stage show, financing the digital capture. So we get a pick of what's out there, but ideally, mm -hmm the best captures are the ones that you have the production on stage in front of a live audience being done in real time. And you bring in a TV crew that is uh, going to protect the integrity of the stage team's vision. So that is like the best and most crucial thing than to bring somebody in who, got, who isn't a theater fan and it's going to just change everything. So with that, the biggest changes that Broadway HD has done, we don't change the direction of the action of the actors. You know, the director doesn't redirect the show. Um, we shoot what's going on, uh, but the lighting is enhanced. We bring in a lighting, a TV lighting uh, director to work with the stage lighting director and we bring in sound uh, to work with the stage sound and a lot of that is just moving the microphone from like a head you know a wig up here to down below or you know vice versa or something that's a little bit less visible when a camera goes in um, but we try not to change as you know anything if we can uh, but lighting is one of the biggest things that gets uh, that gets adjusted, the lighting and the sound. Costumes, we usually don't touch anything. And as I said, the acting, we don't touch anything either. Um, if we do do what we call pickup shots is that we shoot the show in real time a couple of times. And then we say, you know what? This scene requires a little bit more uh, video to make it really to capture what's there. Uh, we did that with uh, 42nd Street. We had 50 actors in it and there was a... Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen it or done it, but there's usually a mirror. There's a mirror because it, 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 you know, it, the mirror, uh, you know, I guess it comes down from the ceiling and shows the dancers on a turntable. So for that, you know, we, the, the actors weren't really directed to do anything differently, but they were directed to just do it over and over again uh, for the purpose of, of getting it right on camera. Um, mm. So, yes, yeah, so we, you know, that's the ideal situation. And that's how when other people do it, that's ideally what they capture. Um, Rebecca asked, does a certain unit unions lean more for or against digital capture? How do unions work with with a filming of the show? You know, I have, as I said, my husband and I have been doing this since 1991. Um, so we have always respected the unions. Broadway has 13 unions that are the stage part. And there's another four of TV uh, unions that kind of get layered on top with the TV directors. Um, so we're working with 17 different unions for Broadway shows. Um, and you know, I think that they have for a long time seen the value of that um, because it's additional revenue for their members after the show closes. And I think that's huge for them. Um, so they've always been willing to work, but it's it's it, it hasn't been uh, it really hasn't been successful. Um, as I said, even when we were doing it at the beginning, it was like, you know what? Give me that money up front because I <laughs> the, the likelihood of you getting your money back is like, you know, so give me something big up front. And you know what? Just in case I'll take a piece on the back. Um, so at Broadway HD, we've been able to, you know, work with everybody, have the financing together to be able to work and say, OK, you know, if we do more than this, if we're now and now we are, we are the most prolific in the space. Our, uh, you know, in-house legal has the most 
uh, the most experience with doing digital captures and of doing digital captures that were, or, or licensing video, I should say, that was uh, done before digital capture was even a word or streaming was even a word. So, you know, we've licensed some things from the BBC and from PBS that were done in the 1950s. And it wasn't done on HD. It was like on an SD, you know, video camera um, and nobody streaming wasn't even you know streaming wasn't even a word then so we've been able to go back do the step up fees um, you know be transparent with the industry be transparent with everybody and say this is the, these are the outlets that we're planning on going to this is what we're planning on doing and so we've been for you know 10 years <laughs> like planning for Broadway HD of trying to work with everybody and say you know we're here in New York for all these years. We're not going anywhere. We're not somebody that's coming in trying to exploit the industry and then race out. You know, we're trying to do this to be additive to people that are working in the industry. You know, we try to work with all, you know, I mean, that's why I feel that the, the capture of the original cast is a huge thing. I think there's a value in it for when you're trying to market it. I also think there's a value in it for the work and the effort that went in by the people that created that. So is their way of, you know, seeing it through and their way of immortalizing, if you will, their performance and their, um, you know, contribution to that particular show, which I, I feel you know, is something that is really uh, much more uh, moral or ethical. Um, probably a little too uh, <laughs> harsh there. Um, but they just it just bothers me when you see um, a great show go to the Hollywood people um, because there's so few people that are in the Broadway industry that are compensated for it. You know, we're all supposed to, it's like the, um, you know, uh, it, it's, so, you know, like life in the theater is just so much harder. Um, you know, uh, I speak to uh, students a lot about, you know, getting into the industry and I don't mean to ever be discouraging to people. I only mean to say, you know, if you think this is going to be easy, then think again. Um, you know, <laughs> here, you know, here in the pandemic. And I mean, and we're, and I, and I don't mean to be insensitive to anybody right now that's out of work. Um, we're just, I mean, this industry is just like laying on the ground right now and there are people that are you know worried about their housing that are food insecure I don't mean to be in any way insensitive to any of that um, but I am an optimist and I do believe that there is a business here um, if you look at theater and you know the, the amount of tickets that are sold if you look at you know who goes if you look at how additive theater is to education how additive theater is to communities it's huge so I don't think people you know, right now, um, you know, understand that. Uh, I know we're wrestling with that right now as we're all countries around the world are trying to, you know, get their governments to support people that are out of work. Um, and, you know, we send mixed signals so often, um, you know, even when the pandemic hit, everybody's like, oh, everybody's out of work. Let's stream everything for free. You know, Broadway HD, you should just stream everything for free. Saying, you know, that's like the worst message that you can send. I I work with these people. I'm not going to ask them to do anything for free. I spent a long time negotiating for the rates that I got with the unions. And I think that the, you know, the rates that I, <laughs> I negotiated are the rates that these people should be paid, you know, mm -hmm. and speaking to the unions and, and where they are is now they're in a, in a, you know, they're between a rock and a hard place with where what's going to happen. I spoke about this several times to people about the the sense of loss right, right now. I mean, people are we can't sleep at night. We're eat, you know we're, we're eating like either you're eating too much, you're not eating enough. People are just all over the place with you know just being you know sad and 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 you know you can't change what life is doing to you, but what you can change and what you can control is how you act after those things happen to you. Um, and I think that you know everybody's just sort of I mean it sounds like so maternal here. You know, I just want you to take care of yourself. And take care of each other and all of that but I think that as an industry we need to do that we need to you know we're an industry that we've always talked about each other instead of as colleagues it's like my family my theater family my Broadway family um, and you know it's never been more important than now but when we're giving things away it sends the wrong message and I think that you know people will come up with and have for years come up with an argument about why they do give things away and a lot of it has to do with brand awareness so mm -hmm. you want people to know who you are so you know in a pandemic we're going to give it away oh here here's something for free um, but if you look I mean the 
you know, the theater industry has for years tried to give things away and it, you know, oh, we're giving it away because we're making it more accessible. And at Broadway HD, accessibility is my mission. You know, I have been for years trying to make theater accessible to everybody around the world. The subscribers at Broadway HD fall into a couple different categories. The first ones are the ones that are the ones that buy tickets to Broadway. So mm. we have over 300 shows on Broadway HD available for streaming on demand. If you're connected to the internet, you have the access to 300 shows for $100 a year. You know, so somebody who buys a, one ticket for a hundred dollars, it's a no brainer. So those ticket buyers buy us immediately. Then you have these people that wish they could buy a ticket for a hundred dollars and they can't. So I am, you know, at Broadway HD, what we are is we're sort of the, the fragrance for a, a luxury brand. So you can't afford the Louis Vuitton bag, but you can afford the fragrance. And so that's what you're going to give yourself or somebody that you love for Christmas, you know, and then then you have the people that are working in the industry, because if you're working in the industry, we know professional development means seeing as many shows as you can. But if you're working in a show, you can't go see a show. Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> so the alternative is like, here you go. 24 seven. Here's an engagement platform serving up full length theater pieces. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you can get your, you know, so for theater fans that are now globally, globally underserved, there's no place in the world that you can go get a live show right now, except online. You know, so my, I'm charging for mine and other people are giving it away. And I just, you know, I look and I say, to me, that's sending the wrong message. I've also argued against that, even though I'm on the, you know, the audience engagement uh, an education committee at the Broadway League. I just don't feel that, you know, giving away tickets has solved anything. Um, mm. You know, free is is not the same as giving somebody access. Um, here, my, my perfect example is the public theater in New York City has been doing free shows in New York City since 1962, 1972. Right. So like 60 years they have in... New York City done free Shakespeare in the Park. There's 2,000 seats in the Delacourt Theater. They do eight shows a week. Well, that's 16,000 seats a week times like, okay, let's say they only do six weeks. So you're giving away 100,000 tickets in one summer for free for some of the most beautiful productions with the most amazing talent in New York City or anywhere in the world, and you sprinkle in like movie celebrities in there. In 60 years, that has not changed who goes to theater in New York City. You still have a 40-year-old white woman who's you know, economic bracket is in the stratosphere compared to other people around the world. And then you go to the touring theaters, and it's even higher. You know, so the, the average average household income of a Broadway touring theater goer is one hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> so you have all these billions of dollars worth of tickets being bought, but they're only being bought by a small percentage of people. And when you compare right. us to, you know, to, to the movies, um, we we are just like nothing by comparison. And then if you want to compare us to the gaming industry, then we're like. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but I think access, you know, in Broadway HD, the access that we provide is, again, it's coming from two different directions for access. So what we provide is access to people. And we in business is a term called the last mile issue or last mile problem, which means whether you're a farmer or you're making furniture, you can make, you know, grow the greatest tomatoes. But if you can't get them to market, it's as good, you know, like, I hope you can eat all those tomatoes you just grew. Yeah. And the same thing with furniture or whatever it is. And so now the theater finds itself in a position of having really serious last mile issues. We can't get anybody to the theater. So Broadway HD for the last five years has always been bringing theater to people's homes um, and being, um, you know, as I said, sort of scrutinized for it all the time. Of, well, it's not exactly the same. Well, you know what? If you can't get there, this is like the best that you can have. Um, so access is so important. And then the other side of access is 
for whose shows get to be seen. If you look at Broadway for the 20, let's look at the 2018, uh, 2019 season, you know, on Broadway every year, there's 41 Broadway theaters in Times Square. Every single year, there's 30, 30 new Broadway shows. So the turnover is there. There's 30 new Broadway shows, there's 30 opportunities for a new team of producers, of uh, directors, of composers, of lyricists, of playwrights to come in. You know, look at any season and you'll find like the last one there that we're all talking about being, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. And, you know, there was two female directors, you know, three female playwright <laughs> composers or lyricists. You know, that's pretty sad. <laughs> um, you know, so we can talk about being inclusive, but when you sit back and look at the stats, we're not. Um, and to the stats, as somebody who has a, you know, an internet, a media internet company, I'm looking at the statistics all the time uh, because mm -hmm. it's all about scaling, you know, um, and what that means is, is like, okay, you need to duplicate that times a million. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, you want that show, you need it a million more times. Um, and and on that, every, when you... Oh, sorry, you know... <laughs> Sorry, when on the when when you who how do you choose the ones that get captured like or uh, power to do so? Yep, any time that I, I've seen a show that's coming to Broadway or off Broadway or regional theater that has you know female or underrepresented voices, I'm looking at it and I'm sending somebody to say, "What are you doing with this? Where are you going?" And you know the the the. Sad reality is that everybody thinks they're on their way to Broadway and then that'll be wouldn't you would not be of a you know, right frame of mind of a right brain to think that you're gonna, you know, for a Broadway musical, it's probably 15 to 20 million dollars to capitalize that show for a play, you know, a million to three million. Um, Harry Potter is a different story, but <laughs> there's always those exceptions out there. Um, yeah. But you wouldn't risk that kind of money unless you truly believe that what you had was Hamilton and that you were going to go, you know, make a movie with, the, you know, D Disney Plus was going to come in and shoot that. So, uh, you know, but by the time people have, you know, it takes probably seven years to develop a show and by the time it gets to Broadway. So I start talking to people sometimes seven years before they get here and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm interested. I'm interested. And it's like, hey, I need to wait till I get my reviews, you know. Um, and then by the time you get your reviews and your ticket or your box office is either tapering or going off a cliff, there's usually not enough time to then go capture that show. And then mm. if your show is falling off the cliff, you're less likely to get your movie from it as well, um, unless there's some fluky thing around it, um, you know. And, and so that's the reality. So if people optioned and planned for that in advance, it would certainly help. And that's what I've been advocating for years, is that treat a digital capture of a Broadway show the same way that you would treat a cast album. Mm. for a musical. People know what that is. No, and people are excited about it. Like, oh my God, we're gonna have a cast album. That's amazing. With a digital capture, it's different because there's more outlets to go. We're not sure exactly what that's gonna look like. You know, who's, you know, it's just, there's too many variables there. Um, and I think cast are usually the first ones to be excited about it. But as I said, producers, and rightly so, are fearful that their $20 million musical is now at risk. Like if I put this $20 million musical on the internet, is that gonna damage my brand or is it gonna enhance it? And I think that you know there is a way to, as I said, include it in your budget, include it in your capitalization. You capture it, you be the one controlling exactly what distribution windows it goes through and what the timing is of that. And you sure. can control that. And then, you know, then you decide my show is closing and I want to, I want to put it out there on the internet or, you know, before everybody sees it in the, in the tours or internationally and see what I can do if there's any interest in it. So, um, you know, it's, and, and these things are changing even as we speak. Um, and so, it's, and they, uh, 
do they generally go out and uh, it's one of Lizanne's question are they are they generally going out before the show is closed or before it goes on regional tour like when do they usually release it or when do they give it to you to to put on Broadway HD which is a, a great question and that has been different over the the years too. Um, I was one of the co-producers on Legally Blonde and MTV wanted to come and do a, you know, a, an MTV version of it. And there was so much nail biting there of like, oh my God, this has never been done before of actually, you know, putting it on at the same time that the show is running. What is that going to do? Um, mm. And I think that, uh, you know, looking back, it was very daring of the lead producers to say, we're going to we're going to do it. We're going to go forward with it. It was also an unusual uh, show uh, brand at that time uh, because of the demographic of the audience. So unlike that 40 year old plus woman that was usually the ticket buyer for a Broadway show, Legally Blonde was a teenager. You know, with her mother, you know, so it was a different audience. So what happened was uh, when MTV aired the show, it kind of did little spikes in the box office in New York, but where the value really was, was when the tour went out because right. the rest of the country couldn't wait for this show. They knew all the songs, they knew all, <laughs> they knew the script, you know, they knew the dance choreography and they were doing it, you know, in the lobby coming into the theater. So it really enhanced the show before they went out. Um, what we did with um, An American in Paris is that we followed it. We just, we kept hounding them because it was visually one of the most beautiful Broadway shows ever, you know, design wise to look at that thing. It was like, wow, that's nuts. That is so beautiful. So we followed it and we waited and we weren't able to shoot it until it was in the West End and then we waited. But, you know, that was so hard because the, when we spend money, we need, I need to put content up. You know, it's like I have to feed the beast. <laughs> it's like I have to mm. constantly put stuff up. And luckily, we've been able to, with Broadway HD, we have stuff in the pipeline to go for another like six to nine months. And then we're looking at what people are doing in, you know, COVID restricted, you know, uh, times here of being really creative and doing some theater. Um, and, and some of that is amazing, some of the stuff that we're doing um, or that we're working with people that are doing. It's just, you know, if you look at, um, we have a show that was done in Australia uh, called Who's Your Bad Daddy? And it is really, it's a great story. We tried to get it when it was here in New York. And they're like, no, we're, you know, we got bigger plans. We're going elsewhere. And then they, you know, started touring and then it still was unavailable to us. And then <laughs> whatever it was two months ago, somebody said, we're going to do it here. And I said, that, that, oh, I love it. I love that show. Yes, yes. How do we get involved? I want to see. And it's just brilliantly done, you know, for something that people are in isolated rooms uh, working with a, a director that's doing it on this sort of Zoom sort of thing. But it doesn't look like the you know, Hollywood Square, Zoom, you know, uh, thing that, they're, you know, things are moving all around. It's just really clever. And I think, you know, show business is filled with people that are really clever, you know, especially mm. people that are in the theater. Um, you know, we're all, you know, we improvise all the time. You know, somebody forgets a prop, you know, the, a light goes out, you, somebody's mic cord comes undone. You know, like all these things, you're just used to, you know, living and breathing and, and, and managing things on your feet and the same with you know people that are in the box office now, okay that you know you don't want to sit there you need that you know you, you can in real time these people are the quickest problem solvers on the planet is people that are working in the live entertainment business it's amazing yeah. and so um you know where we get these things and how they are put together is all different Interesting, interesting. David asks, um, can you name the best non-commercial show which was most popular on uh, or has a huge profit with HD streaming? So is there a non-commercial one that was a surprise for you? Um, well, I, okay, so since it's an international audience, I think that the non-profit mean or non-commercial is like a non-profit, what we call non-profit theatre company. And so the non-profit theatre companies have been the best partners for us because their uh, their seasons are built to take down. So their shows aren't really meant to live, you know, now and forever. It's like, okay, we're going to do it for 
three months, six months, and then our subscribers and our, you know, a family of donors is going to see that show. We're going to take it down and we're going to move on. There's been the rare show uh, that has lived on and that they said, you know what, this is doing so well. Like, let's put everything on hold and we'll work around it. So a perfect example of that is a uh, um, uh, Studio 54's Cabaret with Alan Cumming. And then they were able to do all of the other casting after that and keep it going for a couple of years. Um, so that was crazy. And that one came from the Dunmar. And went, I mean, I wish I had that cabaret, but I do not. But so there's the the nonprofit theater companies that are built to have the shows take down. So they're less worried or not at all worried about cannibalizing their live ticket sales. So, mm. And those are the ones that in pandemic, have been the fastest to pivot to digital because they were already doing that. So Lincoln Center, Roundabout Theater Company, Manhattan uh, Theater Company, uh, I, I'm missing, you know, the Geffen Playhouse, some of these other theater companies that have, they were already doing digital stuff. They were already working with us or somebody else on doing the digital. So the pivot was quick and you know, not, nothing's been easy, and, and but they were much quicker to get their their digital legs under them. Um, mm. Every other theater company has been. You know, you were uh, you were producing live stage shows, and overnight you suddenly had to turn into a TV studio if you wanted to do these live streams and these captures and such. So, um, so the nonprofit partners have been great with us all along. Um, and, to, you know, to Roundabout's credit, uh, Roundabout actually did uh, let us go in and do their She Loves Me while it was still running. They still had uh, shows to run. And we all made the Guinness Book of World Records for being the first live stream of a Broadway show it was with She Loves Me. So that one will always have a piece of my heart um, yeah. for a, you know, coming out of a, a nonprofit. Do you have a favorite on Broadway HD of the musicals or any of the shows that you have on? I mean, at times it's kind of like children. I have five children and you can't ask me which is my favorite thing. You know, um, I have some that I recommend to people for certain things. Um, I would recommend to anybody that's interested in this sort of thing is Who's Your Bag Daddy on Broadway HD. Um, I would recommend to anybody, and I do this a lot, um, people, you know, when I, uh, you know, lecturing or that sounds awful, but when I'm speaking to people that want to, you know, younger people that want to get into the industry, um, you know, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the hurdles? You know, and so often uh, people, you know, and it's not just younger people, people in general that are involved in theater struggle with being commercial. You know, it's that, oh, well, you know, it's, you know, it's a commercial versus a nonprofit. Oh, I work for nonprofit. You know, like there's something once you start putting a price tag on it that there's it's kind of dirty. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, you know, I'm an artist. I don't really do the business side. Um, and I, you know, have to uh, look at it and say it's called show business for a reason. And don't underestimate yourself, whoever you are. You have entrepreneurial skills, you have business skills. As somebody that, as I said, I, I went to school for four years plus uh, for business. Um, people have negotiating skills, they have entrepreneurial skills. I have five children, they're in utero negotiating with me. Like if you don't lay down right this minute, you are going to be terribly sorry. You know, And they come out screaming at you and that's a negotiation. A negotiation is just conflict resolution, you know, so everybody, he has that skill. So especially living in pandemic, your negotiation skills, if you're not living alone, you know, are, 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 your game is like really stepping up. You know, so that the idea of being entrepreneurial, again, in a pandemic, you know, are you going to pay, you know, this bill or that bill? I hope that's not your decision. But you know, how you how you spend your money. Are you going to donate to the Actors Fund or are you going to donate to Broadway Cares Equity Five Days? You know, those are all sort of, you know, business, uh, you know, things that you, you're you already doing that. Um, and, and the idea of the, you know, the business versus commerce, you know, in, a, in an ideal, in a perfect world, everything would be free. Everything would be free. Art would be free everywhere you go. But as I said before, with the public theater as one example of you give it away for free, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, what was your purpose in that? It makes you feel good that you gave tickets for free, but if your mission was to expand the audience or make the diversity of the audience look different, you're kind of 
falling flat there. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, it costs money to make art. And if you look, if we want to talk about art as sculpture or as paintings, look, go into any museum anywhere around the world and you'll see, you know, the fancy people in their furs and their tiaras and whatever it is are the ones, like why are all those people in the museums? Because they were the patrons of the artists. You know, so the artists really would have preferred to do a landscape or a bowl of fruit, but they need to do that portrait of the queen or the king or the whoever first, because that will pay the rent and pay for the next canvas and the paint. You know, so once you put a price tag on it, we're all in the commercial business. And if you look around the world, nonprofit theater companies and, and theaters and organizations that are producing art around the world are are also at the you know at the mercy of who's giving them the money so if you look at even shakespeare you know they had to do their sort of cheeky comments about the queen because she was the patron of shakespeare for a long time you know it's like oh well this is what somebody else would say i didn't say that but this is what somebody you know so there's always that element of you you're working for somebody else and it's a business and, you know, as soon as you put that aside and say, you know, or if you just want to do it as a hobby and you're going to, you know, get a piano and perform in your living room for your family, then, it, you know what, hey, good for you. But, you know, once you turn it into a commercial business, which it, it is the minute you sell a ticket, um, you know, or the minute that you decide to give it away, because it still costs you something to give it away. You know, people in, you know, in theaters will say, we're going to do this free show wherever and we have a patron that's going to underwrite it and i always as a business thing i pull out you know spreadsheets and i go you know there's all these costs over here do you want to call this patron and say you know we got these extra costs because they're putting up that you know there's always you're always going to come out on the negative because you can't you know it's just built that way um and as i said you're just sort of sending the wrong message when you do give it away for free so accept that it's a business accept that you're in the show business and let's all you know move on and the other thing with theater people is that we always because every you're always surrounded by other theater people you assume everybody goes to the theater and everybody loves the theater and that's not the reality either you know speaking to the numbers in the united states there are 350 million people that live in the united states um you know only about 15 percent of them go to see performing arts, that buy a ticket to performing arts. So you've got, you know, you look at these numbers and you're like, oh, wow, look, there's, you know, like 70 million people. The way. Yeah, but when you look at the percentage that that is of the audience and the ones that actually go to Broadway, you know, it's those few people that spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to go buy their tickets, but it's that same, you know, crowd all the time. So when you talk, it, to any of these performing arts centers across the U.S., they're always like, "Oh, we know, no, trying to build up, you know, new audiences." And like, as for me, you know, me, I'm looking at, I'm like, "What's wrong with the old audience? I'm old audience." But I understand <laughs> the point is that you know, it's 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 the replacement. It's replenishing your audience. It's the problem that we see with the Metropolitan Opera and opera companies around the world is that you know, it's the demographic is usually older people, and they're mm -hmm. dying off. And there's nobody replacing those people that have been dying off. And we're trying to get younger people to be interested in that. Um, and I, again, as an optimist, I do believe there is a way to do that. But with some of it, you know, it's so much harder because you we're not in the U.S. a theater going or an opera going culture. And that the sooner you start that in the schools. Now, do you want to get me started on like theater and art in the schools? That's another whole thing. But um, <laughs> I, I'm a huge advocate for, you know, taking people to the theater, um, bring yeah. them younger, expose them as young as you can, because then it becomes part of the culture. And I think that, again, to Broadway HD's credit is that, you know, we're in people's homes. They're on, you know, they, they sign up on their mobiles, but they're watching on their big smart TV. They're gathering in front of a TV with a family to watch a show, not in exactly the same way that if they were going to the theater, but a much more relaxed way, <laughs> you know, but it's exposing younger people to this. Oh, look, the lights all came down. Oh, look, the orchestra comes up really loud. Oh, look, those people are, you know, 
you know, and the, the suspension of disbelief that you have to buy into is huge. You know, I, as I said, I keep talking about my five kids. I have five kids and the education from the first one to like the last ones is really different. The technology that we have, I mean, everybody, we don't need to know facts because everybody has a computer. You're walking around mm. with a computer that you just ask Siri or whoever, you know, for the, for the answers. They're all there. We don't need to know the answers to things anymore. What we need to know is the questions. And that's the creative part of your brain that some people just go there more naturally and other people can be trained to go there or be encouraged to go there. And that the only place you do that is with the arts. You know, if you look at when you take somebody into the theater, um, you know, just what we do in the theater that we just go along for the ride. You go inside that theater and somebody can be standing there you know, on, you know, just standing there and say, here I am on the moon. And, and we all, okay, here we are on the moon. You don't question it. But if that was a movie, you'd say, oh, you know, hey, I can see the strings. Or <laughs> We all get so critical no, no. because we know the technology is there to do these killer, you know, graphics that like we could look like, you know, Matt yeah. Damon floating around in space, you know, so the that's expectations right. are very different. Yeah, and it's so true. I think um, that's a, such an interesting topic that we should probably uh, talk about in the future, which is, you know, in growing audiences for theatre. I didn't realise it was only 15%, and now I want to look out in the other countries how many people go to um, go to theatre in, the, in, in, in their countries because it's interesting. And I am totally on board with you in terms of engagement from a, from a youth perspective is some way to start that culture. So much more to discuss, but we've already covered an hour, Bonnie. So thank you so much for your passion and your enthusiasm of this industry. I've learned so much today and um, I really, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm sure we could talk for another two hours, but we don't want to keep everybody's time. <laughs> I have a couple of things I need to show the audience, which is our upcoming webinars before we kick off and say goodbye. Um, we've got um, uh, Neil Gooding next week. He is another producer in Australia and West End, and I think he's doing in New York soon as well. Um, so he's on November 30. On December 1, we've got How Do We Maintain Motivation with a whole bunch of performers and people in Canada. We're going to talk about that. And we've got a masterclass in stage management uh, going virtual um, with Gareth Hulance, one of our regulars. And uh, that's uh, a paid one. That's USD $15. Um, and he's going to teach you, stage managers, how to go virtual online as he's been doing a lot of stage management virtually so hopefully you'll sign up for those i think rex is going to put those uh registrations there thank you rex in the in the chat box thank you so much for joining us bonnie thank you so much for sharing your experience i'm sure we're going to get you back on again sometime in the future and uh good luck with riding out the pandemic over there in new york thank you everybody stay safe absolutely all right bye for now signing off Thanks, Bonnie. Bye. Thank you.